What's up, you beautiful ass bastards? I hope you're having a fantastic Wednesday. Uh, welcome to the Gus Johnson Show. The set is not real, but let's just jump right into it. Did I get the job? The set is not real. It's not. That's what was so disappointing to see. It's all fake. <laughs> another Wednesday, another new host of the Philip DeFranco Show fired Gus Johnson. He does have a strict no facial hair policy on this show, but despite this unfortunate firing, if you'd like to watch our brand new podcast together, you can check it out right now. I actually just uploaded it before this video over at youtube.com slash a convo with. I'll link that and the audio version down below so you can listen to it wherever you listen to other podcasts. Yeah, it's my once a week podcast where I bring on someone that I'm interested by, trying and learn about them, just kind of shoot it. And this one was a really fun one. I highly recommend you check it after today's show. But with that said, it is time for the PDS. So buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is the situation around Nikki Tutorials. So if you're unfamiliar with Nikki, she's a massive YouTube personality, beauty guru. She also blew up the internet over around two weeks ago. She put out a video coming out as a trans woman. That video just blew up, getting over 33 million views. With this, she got widespread media attention. She ended up being on The Ellen Show. And one of the things with this story that, that really stood out was why. Why was she doing this? And in her video, she said she always wanted to share this information, but she admitted that she was doing it now because someone had threatened to leak her story to the press. Right, and so with that, you had people saying, that's just horrible. She had a blackmailer? Right, and so since that video came out, we had fans, just people online, working hard to track down who tried to blackmail her, with people spreading their own suspicions and conspiracy theories all over social media. Right, so there was that, and now two weeks after, Nikki uploaded another video. It's titled, Responding to My Coming Out, and she addresses the blackmailing aspect of it. First of all, I think we need to stop the witch hunt that I've been seeing going around. I've been seeing so many truth videos out there saying, oh my God, this is Nikki's blackmailer. Oh my God, we found the guy. Oh my God, we found the girl. This and this person are Nikki's blackmailers. Going on to say, I don't think this is your story to tell. If anyone is going to have the right to tell on these blackmailers, it's gonna be me. It's my story. No other person or media outlet should be the one talking about my blackmailer when they only know half of the truth. You are destroying people's lives that aren't even involved in this, and I ask that you stop this. But then, also on the note of the blackmailer, she went on to say that thanks to the help of police, she actually not only knows who the blackmailer is, but also where they live, their phone number, home address, and how they treated people around her to get more information about her story. And let me tell you, when I found out exactly who was behind this all, I was shocked because this is not a person that any of you know. It is someone that I don't even personally know. Going on to say that the information was both frightening and freeing, but it also forced her to make a difficult decision. And then going on to say, ever since finding out the true name of my blackmailer, that has been going on in my mind. If I out this person, am I gonna be doing the same as this person did to me? Do I want that? Do I need that? Do I want to put a human being in the same position that I was in? And then adding, I don't want to lower myself to his level. No, I am creating my own level. I am better than that. And going on to say that in a way, her blackmailer already received their punishment since they now have to live knowing that she knows exactly who they are. And I think they're gonna have a little bit of that fear that one day maybe their name is gonna leak to the press and they're gonna feel exactly the same thing as I was feeling. But adding, I think it is my right to determine if I want that name to come out or not. Additionally, Nikki also dismissed criticisms from those who accused her of lying about being threatened and coming out as a publicity stunt. In fact, she said that she chose to delay upcoming projects to make sure it didn't seem like she had opened up about being transgender to hype up a collab. And she ends the video on a positive note. For the people who are understanding and loving and warm and kind, Thank you. Thank you for me and my community. I will say, as far as my opinion, uh, Nikki is definitely a better person than me. If I was her and this had happened to me, I would a thousand percent destroy this person's life. The kind of outing, in my opinion, is far different. One is exposing a personal secret that was no one else's damn business. And the other is bringing to light someone who committed a crime. That said, it is ultimately and should be her decision. And if anything, it feels like she is empowered by this choice. But that said, still, I will say separately from the situation, I'm a little disheartened that, uh, that a scumbag uh, didn't fully get theirs in this instance. But hey, maybe Nikki's right. Maybe that fear that it could come out is way worse. You know how like sometimes just the thought of getting a shot is, is infinitely worse than actually getting the shot? I don't know, what, what are your thoughts around this one? But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome, brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. If you don't know, Raid Shadow Legends is a collection RPG game that is fantastic and free. Something new for 2020 is you can now play Raid on mobile and desktop. So just play as the same user and just switch between devices whenever you want. It's always a nice day when opening an epic shard and... Okay, actually, I've definitely been needing something a little more tanky. Also, for you right now, gamers can claim free champions and 
more by being Amazon Prime members. Just log in and sign up before February 9th to claim three epic skill tomes and 40 potions. Also, future drops run through April include the epic champion Vala, shards, XP boosts, legendary artifacts, potions, and everything else you need to take on rivals. So just go to the description, click my link, and if you're a new player, you'll also get 100,000 silver, two clan boss keys, 10 mystery shards, and one free champion, the Adjudicator. But do not wait because that offer only lasts for 30 days. And the first bit of awesome is today is Bell Let's Talk Day. And if you're unfamiliar, this is the day where, as Bell explains, they will donate more towards mental health initiatives in Canada by contributing five cents for every applicable text, call, tweet, and retweet, social media video view, and use of our Facebook frame or Snapchat filter. As of recording this video, there have been over 70 million interactions. But of course, more is always better. So you can go to Twitter yourself and use the hashtag Bell Let's Talk, and or you can retweet mine and several other tweets that are linked down below so that it, it gets out there more. Each retweet, of course, adds another five cents. But yeah, just some good times. Then we had Had a Drink giving us drinks from Skyrim. We had Max Richter on NPR Music Tiny Desk Concert. Casually Explained took on Reddit. We had Aquafina exploring ASMR. We got the season two trailer for Narcos Mexico. Vanity Fair gave us everything David Dobrik does in a day. And we had John Oliver fishing for answers. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about the news around an especially disgusting garbage human, the man who was convicted of shooting and killing nine people in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015. And I'm describing him that way because of course we don't say the names of the mass shooters or killers on this show or show their faces. Right, people who commit these crimes in hopes of gaining press or fame or attention from it. But of course, a lot of you likely remember this tragedy that made huge national news. The shooter who admitted that he was a white supremacist killed nine black people during a Bible study at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church. This disgusting monster telling the FBI that he was hoping that this attack would cause racial divide in the country or maybe even a race war. And ultimately, he ended up being convicted on over 30 counts, many of which were hate crimes. And in fact, in 2017, he was sentenced to death, marking the first time that someone was set to be executed for a federal hate crime. Now, notably, during his penalty hearing, he actually represented himself, and that is a big part of why we're talking about him today. His lawyers are now seeking to appeal his convictions and death sentencing, saying that they believe that there were discrepancies made in trial that need to be revisited as they tainted the results. And according to local reports, his lawyer said that he was suffering from mental health issues like schizophrenia when he was representing himself and that he should have been declared incompetent. With lawyers reportedly arguing that, he was a 22-year-old ninth grade dropout who believed his sentence didn't matter because white nationalists would free him from prison after an impending race war. With a lot of reports noting that he didn't make a strong case for himself, even still saying that he felt like he had to draw the attack out. Right, so basically his attorneys are arguing that he was mentally unfit to represent himself and that the judge should not have dismissed what they believe are glaring mental health issues. With the attorney saying his crime was tragic, but this court can have no confidence in the jury's verdict. But also it is worth noting that this piece of trash has consistently denied having mental or psychological disorders. He also told the jury to ignore any claims about his mental state and in documents from evaluations on his mental health, specifically in evaluating for autism. He said things like, I don't have autism, nerds and losers have autism, there's nothing wrong with me, I'm just a sociopath. But now his attorneys are arguing that he was intentionally trying to protect himself from being declared mentally ill and saying that when he was representing himself that he wasn't doing it in a way a competent person would. And ultimately that's where we are with this now, though it should be updated rather soon. The Department of Justice is supposed to respond to the brief in February. As far as my reaction to this appeal, nah. He is a proven white supremacist murderer, into the fire you go. Right, like I understand that there's a debate around the death penalty in general, but if, if there was gonna be like one, you know? But uh, also, what are your thoughts on this? And then let's talk about a story that's an offshoot from the, the Kobe Bryant helicopter tragedy. Because while there's a lot of love and hurt following this helicopter crash, right? Friends, families, pretty much, Everyone's sounding off with their, their their feelings, their experiences, right? Also things like hashtag girl dad trending because of a viral clip talking about Kobe and just him being a girl dad. He loved being a father of four girls and welcomed more. And he said that his wife Vanessa really wanted to try again for a boy, but was sort of jokingly concerned that it would be another girl. And I was like, four girls, are you joking? Like, what would you think? How would you feel? And without hesitation, he said, I would have five more girls if I could. I'm a girl dad. At that same time, there was also a story that was causing a lot of debate, right? And the story is around Felicia Sanmez, who is a political reporter for the Washington Post. On Sunday, the same day that Kobe's helicopter went down, killing him, his daughters Gianna, and seven others, Sanmez tweeted a link to a 2016 Daily Beast article titled Kobe Bryant's Disturbing Rape Case, The DNA Evidence, The Accuser's Story, and The Half Confession. That article detailing a 2003 accusation that Kobe had raped a then 19-year-old hotel employee at a Colorado spa. Kobe was charged with sexual 
assault could have faced up to life in prison. And while he initially told investigators that he hadn't had a sexual encounter with that woman, he later admitted to an affair. However, he noted that it had been consensual. And ultimately, this part of the story ended after Kobe's accuser refused to testify in court. The case was then dropped, with Brian issuing a statement that same day, saying, although I truly believe this encounter between us was consensual, I recognize now that she did not and does not view this incident the same way I did. After months of reviewing discovery, listening to her attorney, and even her testimony in person, I now understand how she feels that she did not consent to this encounter. And as far as the civil side of this, Bryant reportedly later settled with the accuser outside of court. Right, and I explained that so you understand what exactly was linked. But now going back to that reporter, Felicia Sanmez, after posting that first link, we saw her continue to tweet about the situation on Sunday, with her later saying, well, that was eye-opening. To the 10,000 people literally who have commented and emailed me with abuse and death threats, please take a moment and read the story. With her also adding that, quote, any public figure is worth remembering in their totality, even if that public figure is beloved and that totality unsettling. And this seemingly extra meaningful to her because she is also a sexual assault survivor. Also in another tweet, she included an image of her email box with that image also including the names of some of the people who'd sent her those reported threats. Right, and so following this, you had people calling for the Washington Post to fire her. And following that, we ended up seeing Felicia deleting all her tweets about Kobe. And then soon after we saw the announcement that the Post had reportedly suspended her. And in a statement, Tracy Grant, a managing editor for the Post, said that Felicia, quote, was placed on administrative leave while the Post reviews whether tweets about the death of Kobe Bryant violated the Post newsroom social media policy, adding that the tweets displayed poor judgment that undermined the work of her colleagues. Felicia's suspension then sparked its own amount of controversy and backlash online, just like you had people calling for her to be removed, you had people saying that she should be reinstated. Also, notably, some of that support came in the form of nearly 350 journalists for the Post, with those journalists all endorsing a statement from the Washington Post Guild that backed Sanmez. And in an opinion piece, media critic Eric Wemple asked, what did she do wrong? Saying she only tweeted out a link to a, quote, very good story from the Daily Beast. In that column, Wemple argues that Felicia was only reminding everyone of a real incident from Kobe's life. And also in an interview with Wemple, Felicia revealed that she had emailed two of her editors Sunday night to tell them about the threats. Saying she also included links to her tweets. Editor Tracy Grant then asked her to delete them. She says she was a little delayed in taking them down. This in part because someone had doxed her home address. Grant then reportedly sending her another email reading that she'd be in violation of a directive from a managing editor if she didn't delete her tweet. Semez then did that. A move that Wemple argues provided a victory for the people who had attacked her for posting a perfectly fine news story. Wemple then going on to say that out of fear for her own safety, Felicia checked into a hotel Sunday night where she ended up learning that she had been placed on administrative leave immediately. Grant then reportedly told Felicia that her tweets did not pertain to her coverage area and that she was making it difficult for others at the Post to do their own work. And there we see Wemple argue that if journalists can be suspended for tweeting outside of their own beat, then the entire newsroom would be on leave. Also saying that Grant's claim that Felicia complicated others' work needs supporting evidence. And Wemple then ended his column by reciting one of the Post's main principles. The newspaper shall tell all the truth so far as it can learn it concerning the important affairs of America and the world. And so with all of that, what we ended up finally seeing was the Washington Post clearing and reinstating Sanmez, with the newspaper's editors admitting that they had been out of line in suspending her. Grant saying in a statement, Reporters on social media represent the Washington Post, and our policy states we must be ever mindful of preserving the reputation of the Washington Post for journalistic excellence, fairness, and independence. We consistently urge restraint, which is particularly important when there are tragic deaths. We regret having spoken publicly about a personnel matter. Now, following this, we saw the Post Guild call the reinstatement welcome, but also noting that Grant's statement did not include an apology to Felicia. Also noting that the Post didn't take swift action to provide her with protection and support. And kind of going even further than that, we saw on Twitter Felicia release a statement saying, I believe that Washington Post readers and employees, including myself, deserve to hear directly from Marty Barron, the Post's editor, on the newspaper's handling of this matter. But as of recording this video, we have not seen that, and ultimately that is where we are. And so with this story, I, I would love to know your thoughts. Do you feel like Marty Barron and the team above Felicia handled this horribly? Or do you think that what they did makes sense? Or maybe they should have gone the complete opposite way, got rid of her? Also, do you think that it was wrong for Felicia to initially post that tweet and the link to the story? Was the timing the reason? Any and all thoughts, I'd love to hear from you in those comments down below. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. Of course, as always, thank you for watching my little daily news show. Also, if you're looking for more to watch, you can definitely check out that brand new podcast I put out with Gus Johnson today, or maybe just miss the last Philip DeFranco show you want to catch up, you can click or tap right there to watch either of those right now. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love your faces, and I'll see you tomorrow. I hope you liked the video. Subscribe if you like it.